following is a presentation of the Retro Network. And welcome to another installment of The Wizard Files, the special interview series where we go behind the scenes with the people who created Wizard Magazine and the comic book professionals who filled its pages. Joining me tonight is Michael Schwartz, the author of the exciting new supernatural adventure comic book series, Armored, from Clover Press. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing well, Adam. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, glad to have you with us here, because this time around, we're actually going to be talking to the publisher of Clover Press, who has been helping Armored make its way to the public. So through that relationship that you have, you set up this interview. So thanks a lot. Yeah, so we are going to be talking to this man with decades in the comic book business that have found him integral to the launch of Image Comics, working at Malibu Comics, DC Comics, the Vertigo imprint, Wildstorm, so much more. So Hank Canals, welcome. Hey there. Oh, this is very, very fun uh, to get a chance to speak with you. Yours is a name that, as we have covered every issue of Wizard Magazine, just, you know, keeps popping up here and there. It's like, <laughs> oh, hey, Canals, hey, Canals. So, so this is great to finally get uh, your side of the story, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so I'll kick it off since yeah. you know, you've been the publisher of my comic, Armored, which will be coming out next year. I've gotten to know you as my publisher, but I'd like to know... How did you discover comic books and what was your first steps towards uh, becoming a professional in the industry? Oh, man. You have to go way back. A long, long time ago, as a kid, moved around quite a bit. Uh, my dad worked for a defense company, so we were stationed in a lot of different locations. And one of the constants was being able to move and take a stack of comics with me with every move. That was like my my touchstone back home, right? I distinctly remember living in Brazil for a few years and our neighbors in the apartment complex were moving. They were in the military and they got restationed and the uh, parents of my friend who was moving would not let him take his comics. So I had my little stack of comics, but he had like four boxes. And this is before comic book boxes existed. So he had four moving boxes of comics that he just basically dropped off and said, I can't take these with me. Do you want them? And it's like, heck yeah. And that really opened up the comic collecting because he had so many other books that I didn't even know existed. And then, of course, he had gaps. So uh, my OCD kicked in and needed to start filling those gaps. And I was blessed because my parents did let me move with those boxes. So every time we moved, those boxes would come with. Um, and then every time I'd find a new location, I'd start hunting for the missing comics and then discover a new series. I am curious, were the comics like they were American comics because it was American people that were living around you or were they in Portuguese? They were all American. They were bought mostly at the PX, right? So that was a, a good blessing. I wish that I had some of the Portuguese comics from the 70s. That would that would have been like incredible additions to my collection. Settled in Texas, uh, where my first job was bagging and uh, sorting comic books. Uh, there was a comic shop called Remember When in Plano, Texas. I lived in Richardson at the time. And I would go in on Saturdays, and if they needed comics bagged, they didn't have boards back then either. I'm old. They would let me bag comics for store credit. And so I would work there for hours, earn X number of dollars in store credit, and then just spend it the same day and take home a stack of comics. It was the best job ever. I wish um, I could have that job now. I want that. Right? <laughs> well, there's, and there's a, there's a piece to it. There's, you know, because it's a repetitive, somewhat thoughtless action. So very meditative. And word of my skills spread. And I ended up also getting a job at Half Price Comics and Books. And the best thing there was they would buy collections. And they would buy old collections of unbagged comics. So they need somebody to go through and sort and price and marked down. So some of the stuff was junk. You could, you know, we, they would mark it for going out on the floor for half price, but a, a lot of it was valuable. So they had me pricing and bagging there. And people were so impressed with my skills doing that, that there was a prominent dealer in, in Dallas that, that did the conventions, the fancy fairs and the festivals. And 
he would drop off. And by this time they did have long boxes. He would drop off long boxes to my house and, and have me bag and alphabetize everything. And the best thing about that is he was buying DC Silver Age books. So uh, I got first dibs on all his books, which is fantastic. And again, I would do it for credit. So I would furiously bag and he would pay me to alphabetize too, which if you, you, know, you get seven long boxes of someone else's collection, it takes a long time to figure all that out. But first dibs on those books. Unfortunately, the owner of the Remember When comic shop passed away. Comic book shop was sold to a guy named Bob Wayne. He converted the book and he hired me as a staff employee. It was, you know, in high school, I was, again, the dream job. I'm working at a comic and hobby shop. Uh, they had little lead figures. I would do the cycle sheets for the comics. And then tragedy struck and I had to move to California, giving up the most amazing job ever as a teenager. Come to turn out that Bob Wayne ended up selling his shops and he ended up working for DC, moving up in the ranks as the senior vice president of sales for DC. And I moved to California. That's my origin story. So. Okay. So, Hank, uh, you know, the thing I'm curious to know is obviously, you know, you're a fan, you're meeting other fans. One of those is a gentleman we know very well, Rob Liefeld. And then you guys make your way, you know, into professional comic books together in, you know, what really is the impetus for what we are doing here on this podcast, you know, re-examining the 90s comic book boom. So can you tell us about your first meeting with Rob and then how you guys got to working on the Youngblood concept? Sure. Well, so all this time when I was everybody's bag man, I was also working to break into the comic industry. And like everyone, figured I would draw comics for a living because how awesome is that? I get to sit around and draw all day. Come to find out it's freaking hard and I don't have the level of talent that is needed to do that. So um, around that time, I was a member of what's called an APA, an Amateur Press Association. Uh, it was called Titan Talk. I had joined them when I was uh, in Texas in high school. A great little organization formed by Margie Spears. I remember seeing something in a letter column of uh, the New Teen Titans about this APA. So I joined the waiting list and eventually moved up to being a member of Titan Talk. Yeah, it's pre-internet and it was certainly a way to connect in between conventions, right? So Rob was also a member of that and uh, we had spun off and there was another APA called uh, Young Heroes Amateur Press Association, YAPA, and a lot of people joined that and we grew that. I was uh, on the wait list for Interlac the Legion of Superheroes APA for a while. And, and so I, I was doing that from Texas. Rob lived in California. Yeah. So when my family up and moved from Texas to California, you know, the first thing I did was I looked through the, the mailing list of the APAs and connected with people who lived in California. Luckily enough, we moved to Southern California. We moved to Corona and Rob lived in Fullerton, not that far apart, maybe a 45 minute drive apart. If you don't have a car, of course, it, it might as well be across the country. But once I got my license in my car, it really closed the gap. And so we hung out and we... Uh, we talked about comics all the time. His big dream was to break in as an artist and mine was to break in as a writer. And we started collaborating on some things. Some of the earliest stuff, it really was a Titans, a Teen Titans West proposal and pitch. If you go through the old issues of the Appas, you'll see some of the formative stories for Youngblood. When his style was like super George Perez influenced, Youngblood was sort of a, you know, more of a Titans and Legion style book. Then Rob actually did break in and obviously was on New Mutants and X-Force and really developed that style that that he's known for kind of shifted the look and feel and vibe of young blood after that i think he's even published some of the early sample pages he we had we basically wrote little stories so that he would have sample pages to then show in his portfolio the early set has a, a, a legion of superheroes tryout vibe to it and like the early shots of cougar and other characters really cool stuff yeah, and what's interesting, I think, is, you know, obviously, you know, you guys are, are fans, you're you're trying to get in there, he's he's exploding. And in the early issues of Wizard, like in issue number 10, which had the cable shaft cover that, that Rob drew, you are actually interviewed in there. You know, the title is, you know, my actual title is Scripter. And so you yeah. get the full interview in that issue as as the the writer of Youngblood, somebody who's the question I wanted to ask you is so years later. Rob eventually brought on Joe Casey, who we just had on the podcast, to remaster, so to speak, those early issues of Young Bloody, completely rewriting, you know, your script from back then. I'm just curious, how did you feel about the project when you heard about it? Like, were you just like, well, I was young then, it could use some polish, or were you kind of like, hmm? <laughs> yeah, it's certainly not the strongest piece of work. It was something that 
Rob drew the pages and he had the rough plot in mind and I had never scripted someone else's story before. I don't think I read Joe's version until after the fact. Mixed feelings. Uh, if, it, if people felt it needed a remastering, then that's certainly their prerogative. Certainly heard enough feedback about it. And it's, you know, it's, the story is what the story is. So when it launched, you know, obviously it set a lot of records at the time, but it got a lot of negative backlash. It absolutely could have been better. I've never denied that. I think my strongest memory was going to a convention. Rob did not attend. It was a smaller show. And there was certainly a line for people asking for their book to be signed and certainly heard enough positive feedback. But one guy walks up to me and says, you know, I really have some strong thoughts about your comic. And it's like, oh, you know, you know thanks. And he just he takes the comic and he tears it in half. Oh my God. And I was like, okay, those are definitely some strong feelings. But years later, you know, I, I still meet people who say that Young Blood changed it all for them. And, you know, a couple of times people will say that. And I think they're kind of, you know, trying to get a rise out of me, but, the, but they're actually sincere. And they say, no, no, no. Like, I love Young Blood number one. And it's great to hear that. It's interesting given how it launched and where we are today. But I'm certainly gratified for the, I, I'm very grateful for the experience. So, well, I definitely think it, it may have a lot to do with age too, I wonder. Like I know, sure. you know, all of my friends when it came out that, you know, that's what we ran and, and bought. We bought Youngblood, but that's what yeah. we were, it was like, screw Marvel, screw DC. We're all in on image and we were into it. It was just action packed and fun. I think it resonates with my generation in particular, which is your generation, Adam. Like I'm sure it had an impact on us. Just the, the image alone, it, it's so iconic now. That like, you know, people are yeah. doing homages of that cover constantly. Speaking of the memories from that time, is there any memories you have of the formation of Image Comics that stick out in your mind? Yeah, absolutely. And and it, it wouldn't be a Wizards podcast if I didn't bring this up. Is So there's, there's a famous picture that keeps coming up all the time. Every year, certainly around anniversary of Image's formation, it, it certainly hit the internet pretty hard this year with the 30th. But every anniversary, every time they talk about the founding of Image, there's this picture of the founders of Image. And I'm in that picture. Garib actually kind of shoved me into that picture. I didn't want to be in it because I certainly wasn't one of the headlining artists. But he said, no, 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 you're an important part of this. You need to be in this picture. It's like the formation of the Beatles. And so that's the picture. And Garib was kind enough to make prints of that picture and uh, frame it and send it to all the, all the founders. And that picture constantly runs and everyone thinks I'm Wills Cretaccio. Um, <laughs> because Wills was a founder of Image, but he was in the Philippines at the time and he was unable to make that meeting. That was taken in Mark Silvestri's living room in Cardiff by the Sea. So I'm in that picture. And Wizard would run that. And then because of the confusion at conventions, people would come up with wet works and say, you know, hey, Mr. Wills, would you please sign uh, my comic? <laughs> couple issues of X-Men, uh, but mostly wet works. And I'd be like, oh, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to, but I'm, I'm not with Pratasha. I'm so sorry. So then the geniuses at Wizard, and, and I got to work with, with Brian Cunningham and Pat McCallum for many years at DC. They started putting Wills' head on my body, which if you ever met Wills, you know, we, we have very distinctly different body types and faces. So it was a little Franken Wills in that picture. But people would then know who Wills Pertasio was. I, I think at one point, I started objecting to the fact that they would Photoshop the, the head on the body to the point where they just started putting a little circle with his picture in the circle and then covering me, obliterated nonetheless. <laughs> um, I, and I remember bringing that up to Pat and uh, and Brian at the DC offices when we worked together. And then they, they started posting pictures all over the office of of other people with my head photoshopped on <laughs> on the body knowing how much i loved that that's amazing wow so but you were there right you're you're watching this happen at the beginning you know rob is an integral force and in, in getting that going and here you are though like you say you're you're one of the creators launching the first title for image comics and do i understand correctly you also designed the image i was that mm -hmm. So you, you designed the logo itself for what was so iconic. So that being the case, like during all that excitement, during all the enthusiasm, were you like staying involved and trying to be there as much as possible? Did you kind of start taking a step back? Like how did you personally experience the explosion of image? It was amazing that the first round was just, it, I don't think anyone expected it to blow up as big as it did, as fast as it did. And then everyone adjusted pretty quickly. 
a lot of that rollout was contingent on what material was done. So, you know, looking back, would it have made more sense to bank more material uh, and then roll it out? Absolutely. But I, th- I think at that point, because of the sequence of events, you know, some of which I was in the room for, some of which I was absolutely not in the room for, you know, between the creators and Marvel and the, the exit plan, it had to roll out the way it rolled out. I'd like to think if they were to do it all over again, they would do it differently and 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 have more banked and not have as many delays. I think at first, the delays between the issues kind of created more demand, more excitement, more fever over the stuff. And so, you know, th- there is absolutely a, a benefit to that. But then, as we know, the constant delays between issues then started to really damage the momentum. Yeah, we, we were just over- David Wall from, you know, mm-hmm. who was over at Top Cow eventually. And he was talking about how ultimately they were publishing ads in Wizard saying, hey, guaranteed you will get your books each month. Order our books, you know, and then their sales shot up because they were willing to make a guarantee, whereas everybody else was maybe kind of struggling. Even Todd at times, you know, was backed yeah. up and it was just something that was not happening on the regular. Well, so like the other books, though, also had writers and the writers weren't part of the formation of Image. And I think that was kind of a weird thing. So I became less and less involved with with that aspect. And, you know, truth be told, the stars of Image were those founders. You know, you can't deny that it was Rob, Todd, you know, Jim, everybody. And then it was quite something when you got the invitation to join, right? Or more so if you did not get the invitation to join. So that was that was a fascinating time. Going back to the photo, I've recently been reading the series Local Man. And yeah. I noticed, uh, I was showing Adam that there's there's a panel in there that, and there's a character with a striking resemblance to you and that photo. I presume you're aware of it or? Did, yeah, uh, it was great. Uh, uh, Tony and, and Tim out of the blue had no idea they were doing it. I think it was Tim that tweeted it, which is how it came to my attention. That's how I and saw he, it. And it was a it was a shot and they made all the other image founders into superheroes or, or superpowered people. And then they had me. They didn't change me. And I'm even in the same <laughs> green shirt. And his tweet was that every super team has to have a Hank, um, <laughs> I love which it. I took as a compliment. And he uh, confirmed it as such. And so he, he sent me some copies and I, I bought two at the comic shop before he sent them. Because So once of... they hit like issue eight or nine, they're going to change your head though, right? They warned you about that? <laughs> yeah, right. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think by now Tim knows that's a hot button for me too. So. <laughs> Not a hot button, but you know, it's just a, it's a right. funny thing. So from there, uh, I ended up at Malibu Comics. The Malibu was the distributors of an Image at the time. Uh, I was writing a book called uh, The X-Mutants for them, and uh, they needed some help on staff. I got along well with the folks there, uh, so they invited me on staff. And uh, right around a joining staff there, they were launching something called The Ultraverse, which is also a, a line that uh, people remember fondly, which is great to see. The company itself grew fairly quickly because of the association with Image and the distribution of Image, but then they spun out and did their own things. and. Image eventually was able to leave the company. And at that point, they were building the company to be purchased. And and DC Comics basically was the winner in purchasing Malibu Comics until the 11th hour when uh, Marvel swooped in and bought the company. So I ended up working at Marvel for a few years. Uh, And then they had a huge layoff, series of layoffs when the crash came. And so I was part of the, I think, the third wave of layoffs, thus my editorial portion of comics was uh, was done for the, for that moment. From there, I went to uh, Warner Brothers. To the day, actually, I think I was telling someone the other day, the severance package that Marvel offered expired on a Friday, and the following Monday in March is when my job at Warner Brothers started. And then it was a 25-year run at Warner and DC Comics. Wow. Getting back real quick to Malibu and the Ultraverse, we had Dave Ulbrich on a, a while back, and we were talking to him all about, you know, the Marvel acquisition and just kind of the excitement of launching the Ultraverse and all of that. So did you have a favorite title? Uh, you know, obviously you were working on their, you know, original titles like X-Mutants and things like that, but did yeah. you have something from the Ultraverse that you were involved in that you thought was a fun concept? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, so I, I was working on experience as the writer, and then the, they wanted to take the series in a different direction. So then I ended up joining the editorial staff. And I was, you know, it was a small company, a bunch of desks in a room, you know, not even cubes, right? So we were just sort of facing each other. We could hear each other's phone calls. We would 
you know, be working away on our projects. And I remember, I distinctly remember going to Chris and Dave and saying, look, this Ultraverse thing's pretty exciting. I can help you with this. And, you know, they, they kind of like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And it's like, no, 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 let's look at what you've got going and let's see if we can't get some really named talent on these books. So we, we did, we were able to kind of upgrade uh, the folks working on the line. So I became the line editor of Ultraverse. You know, it's hard to pick a favorite because they were all really, really interesting, really cool. But I would I would say Firearm was up there as uh, James Robinson and Cully Hamner. A fantastic combination and a, a real nice take. James's early career, of course, and he started establishing himself, really did Firearm and then kind of started doing Starman and then really made a name for himself on Starman. Yeah, a comic book that distinctly came with its own VHS tape that had right. you know, an actual live action short film explaining the premise of the movie and, and bringing it to life, which is just the yeah. Ultraverse, the, the promotion for that line was amazing. Just the marketing we, you guys were doing. Yeah, we did a lot of firsts. We had bus ads, not bus, well, we had bus stops ads but we had actually ads on buses in the la area we did national commercials i actually remember filming the commercials on the warner brothers lot uh, and if if you ever watch the commercial there's there's one where there's a red they needed a car for the skateboarder to jump over so that was my car and then they had me getting out of the car and you know doing the whole <laughs> take of the person going over in the, in the skateboard you know they had chris and i think dave was in those commercials too they had a, an open call for some extras and i think one of the owner's sons was one of the actors in the commercial up until that point i don't think ever since then even uh, you, you've seen nationwide commercial buys for comics. It, it was amazing. Oh, yeah. And obviously Wizard was really big in promoting, you know, the Ultraverse. Well, when we landed George Perez for Breakthrough, the uh, crossover and Ultra Force, uh, we did the little mini comic in the Wizard magazines. And so there's an A and a B comic, highly sought after. So that was great. And that was a great experience, too, when we did the Ultra Force cartoon. Again, so much fun. Had never been an animated series before. Were um, you involved in that? Like, directly? Oh, yeah. Cartoon? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, was a, I was a story editor, and I had to approve. This was a story, right? We, we had all these character designs done. We worked on this prior to Marvel purchasing us, and then once that went through... Marvel was looking at all the stuff and and they were hoping for another X-Men hit and they weren't happy with what they were getting. And so uh, we had to start from scratch and we flew in George to redesign the turnarounds for the animated series. So it had a very particular animated look by Galoob and then Marvel wanted it to look more comic booky. And so who better to do that than than George? So he was great. But being locked in a room at Galoob with George Perez and the character designers for the animated series just working out the, the turnarounds are just, it's amazing it's, well the x-men animated series connection there is hilarious to me is that they got the voice of jubilee to yeah. voice you know what one, one of the characters <laughs> in the show too so you're just like we want it exactly like x-men this yeah. female character is gonna have the same voice <laughs> yeah and the toys were really good uh, oh, yeah. again again never made toys before but that fell in in my department so we're quite a bit we have some some brian hitch pieces for the packaging some jerome moore pieces and then obviously some george perez pieces all for the packaging but the sculpts were great for for the time you know this was pre-sideshow pre mcfarlane stuff it was uh, pretty highly detailed it was, um, yeah really nice stuff so so from malibu and ultraverse like when you moved over to Warner Brothers, what projects were you like specifically involved with once you moved over there? So the experience that I had at, at Malibu had me working with a lot of licensed material. So I remember having to take a call from, from Gail Ann Hurd to talk about Prime and what was the what was the driving engine for, for the Prime series. I had to work with Galoob on all the toys, worked with Deke for the animated series. Angle Luke, because obviously the, it was being funded by the toy company, right? So at, at that time, uh, they were looking to move a component of the DC's uh, licensing department from New York to Burbank. And uh, they were looking for someone who had comic book licensing experience. So I, I was a last minute interview for them. I, I interviewed with six different people, two of whom were in New York. So they, they were phone interviews and then a whole bunch of executives at, at Warner Brothers in Burbank. And I had the experience that they were looking for. They needed someone who had knowledge of comics and specifically DC comics, but also understood the licensing business. So they hired me and I worked there for a few years until they cut a, an amazing deal with six flags and they needed someone 
and with licensing experience to uh, travel the world and ride roller coasters on their behalf. Um, oh basically approving all the rides and the commercials and the product. Any use of licensed characters, not just DC, but the Hanna-Barbera characters, all the, all the Warner Brothers characters, all the Looney Tunes, Wizard of Oz, everything, the whole catalog. So I did that for eight years. So Riddler's Revenge is coming out, the Batman yeah. posters, like all, all this stuff, the Superman, the ride where you fly up that huge tower. So, so you're yeah. out there, were they doing a lot of rebranding where they would just say, okay, we have the coaster, but now we're going to attach it to a different character. Like no built from scratch. Most everything was built from scratch. Batman, the ride, of course, revolutionized roller coasters Yeah, that launched before I was in this position, but that was, that actually showed everyone the power of branding outside of Disney. I mean, obviously if you go to Disneyland, you understand the power of branding these attractions. Um, Six Flags really got it and you know they didn't have the budgets that the imagineers at, at disney had and you know you ask me i would prefer they put the money into the actual coaster safety first but when you're standing in line for an hour you want something to just stimulate and, and interest you so that was my favorite thing i i grew yeah. up in southern california too i'm an orange county kid and so yeah. i you know i would go to six flags and like just being there like i was like yeah i'm gonna ride a coaster but i'm in gotham right now exactly. or I'm like I'm, I'm in the fortress of solitude like i'm feeling you know this thing come to life so did you have a favorite of those projects you got to kind of shepherd or help along there's so many there was this great justice league plaza that we did in georgia and we were able to engage a lot of artists to do these huge images of the characters uh, that was particularly interesting i have a real fondness for the superman ride uh, there was a time where i had to shoot some footage for a warner Bros. presentation for the sales department they're showing uh, some big presentation on the lot and i had to write that thing seven times in a row and it, it shoots you straight up in the air 100 miles an hour and then go down backwards um so i have a fondness for that ride i've only been to six flags once i you know as a canadian we don't have it here right mm -hmm. so but we can go down to uh upstate new york and and there's one there and none of us wanted to ride it except my sister's best friend. And she basically passed out on the coaster. And we could see her in the distance, just like this, flailing. <laughs> and Wizard was really big into promoting all the theme parks. They would do trips. They would do these like kind of photo stories about, oh, look at the yeah. newest ride that's coming up, coming up, based on a comic, you know, especially, you know, eventually Islands of Adventure, Universal Studios, things like that. But I want to ask you, because we are a Wizard Magazine podcast, and you mentioned Brian, you mentioned Pat, Garib, pulling you into that famous photo but what was your opinion of wizard magazine when it first launched and how did your opinion evolve over the years as you had interactions with the crew over there you know when it first launched super exciting here's a magazine that talks about the stuff that i love right and and early on i, I didn't mention this before but i had done a lot of articles for comic scene it was uh starlog's comic book magazine so I did, I did interviews with folks um for that magazine wizard of course comes along and that becomes the big competitor right i thought their tone was right on that's what the industry needed at the time then you start, you know, hearing things, finding out about things. Like I had no idea that, that there was a comic book retail connection to the magazine until much later, it, it, which is like, duh, right? But coming out of retail, they really were hit makers, though. They were able to not only determine what was hot, but also then nudge the market into directions that they wanted it to go. I'll say it that way. Yeah, so so you found it entertaining, but then you mm -hmm. also noticed, okay, they, they do have a big influence. Now, did that ever affect you directly? Like, would you ever reach out to Garib or whoever and say like, hey, I got a project going here? Or did you just naturally find yourself interacting with them as you move from company to company? Yeah, well, I mean, when I was still in the publishing side of things, we would have conversations. When I landed at DC, Brian came up to me and said, I don't know if you remember me, but we used to talk all the time about Prime. It's like, oh, I absolutely remember you, Brian. You know, because he, he, so he was an editor and a writer at, at Wizard. One of his favorite books was Prime. And we would talk about that all the time, about what was coming up. When I left Marvel at that point, the work I was doing wasn't really Wizard related. You know, I, I would see Garib at shows. Um, I would pick up the magazine if something was, was interesting on the cover or, or on the inside. And then uh, by the time I got to D.C., you know, it wasn't really so active anymore. It's true. So, yeah. Yeah. They were they were on yeah. their last legs. <laughs> yeah. How did you segue over to D.C. and the Vertigo line? So that job that I had, 
the bulk of like you know all the all the muscle was around the DC characters. So they had stunt shows, they had the multi-million dollar coasters, the marketing campaigns for the parks in each one of the areas was was very DC centric because it's like it's it's not just come to Six Flags, it's come to Six Flags and be the Batman, ride the ride. So uh, we we did a ton of work. Plus, the job that first started was specifically working with DC. I remember being in a meeting with Paul. We were meeting with the Six Flags folks, and we were going over a script for the Batman stunt show. And Paul said, "Hey, this is this is a fine script. It's great. It's got good structure. It's exactly what we're looking for. Except that it's the plot to Daredevil number seventeen. And then he looks to me, he goes, or maybe it's Daredevil eighteen. What do you think, Hank?" And it's just like, you know, the guys from Six Flags wouldn't know Batman from Daredevil, though no offense to any of my friends at Six Flags. And honestly, I wouldn't have known if it was Daredevil 17 or 18, because uh, my brain just didn't catalog Marvel stories in that way. I asked me DC, absolutely. So it was, it was odd that Paul, uh, at the time, I think the president of DC, I'm pretty sure it was 18, Paul. And, you know, we just kind of moved along. And after that meeting, he pulls me aside and he said, you know, you've, you've got a choice. You can continue doing what you're doing. You do it well and you can become like a, a, an Imagineer at Disney or, or, you know, pursue more of the theme park aspect of your life. And it was a great job, guys. Or you can come work for me at DC. You know, we'll find a desk for you at DC. It, and that meant New York, right? And my wife would not relocate to New York. So it's, it's like, I really appreciate that offer. It's fantastic. So I continued to do the theme park job. And I, again, traveling the world until 9-11. And I was, uh, I was in the air uh, when it all happened. And on my way to Madrid, we were building a park in Spain. Landed in Spain. Airport was completely empty. Taxi cab driver takes me to my hotel. Doesn't mention anything about what happened. Or maybe he did, and I just didn't understand. But I get to the hotel in downtown Madrid. I check in, and they said, you know, have you checked in with your family? And it's just like, that's the weirdest thing anyone's ever asked me. Checking into a hotel, you know? And it's like, oh, no, I think they're, they're fine. It's not the right time to call. I'll call them later. And, and they go, no, no, sir, you need to check in with your family. It's like, why? He goes, well, go upstairs to your room and turn on the TV. Turn on the TV, and 9-11's all over there. Tried to get a hold of my family. Took me maybe eight hours before I could get a clear line through. And my wife, of course, just a mess because she hadn't heard from me the whole day. Doesn't know what's going on. She's like, she goes, you, you, I can't, I can't handle you traveling like this anymore. So the next week I called up Paul and said, okay, I'm ready to make the change. And so I ended up at Wildstorm running the studio for Jim in DC uh, down on in San Diego. It was a much easier move to convince my wife to move from at the time it was Valencia, right, down to San Diego. And so lived there for and ran Wildstorm for many, many years. And then everything happened at DC where uh, where Dan and, and Jim ended up the co-publishers and we moved the entire operation from at the time, La Jolla, up to Burbank. And so we had two offices in their heads. It didn't make sense to have three. So we consolidated everyone into Burbank on the West Coast and then kept the East Coast offices running for a few years. And then eventually they moved the East Coast office into Burbank as well. I, I'm curious what, what, about the, the Wild Storm. Like, what were the big titles as you're coming in that you guys were really managing and pushing? I mean, is this the authority era? Is this all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Well, I came in like so right after that. Ex Machina was a pretty big deal. It was a, it was a fantastic book. And Tony Harris and Brian K. Vaughn did amazing work on that book. We were doing a lot of the video game comics. We ended up relaunching with Grant Morrison, uh, Wildcats, and The Authority. And then true to form, a lot of delays in between issues. And, the, and, and you know, by that point, no one was having it. If you're that late between issues, you, you kill all momentum. Out of the studio also, we were doing all the design work for the DC Universe Online game. Uh, we did the World of Warcraft comic. One of the things that we did was the, uh, the Gears of War comic. And it was, it was the best-selling comic of that year. But because of the way uh, Diamond reports things and because of the way the status of, you know, best-selling comic of the year is calculated, it got disqualified. But that one, I think you know, we sold easily over 400,000 copies of Gears of War number one, and we just couldn't get the cred for doing that. We're, we're going to have um, to keep an eye out if anywhere in Wizard it's mentioned and if, if they acknowledged it, because I'm sure like that would have been the ultimate place to say, okay, guess what? 
hey, this one's right? selling, but it didn't it make was. it out of the top 10 or anything. No. Well, because we got it distributed through Blockbuster and GameStop. That's the dream, right? Is to find other ways to get your comic book out there. Direct market's fantastic, but you're limited by the footprint of your direct market. So the idea was to figure out other ways uh, to get it out there. One series of note was The Boys. That started at Wildstorm, and that was while I was there. I distinctly remember this. It was going up between issues. It's very rare, as you know, that sales on a comic increases as the series goes along. This was one of them, and it was it was jumping up quite a bit. We had to go back to press on number one. The numbers, I think, I was I was driving in when this call was happening, and the, the orders were super high, higher than many DC books. Paul was not at that meeting, but uh, but after we made some, you know, like everyone was supportive of the series until Paul read a particular issue, and he said, I can't keep publishing this, and he killed it. And there was no coming back from that. So we we did the responsible thing, and we, we helped find another publisher and certainly worked out the rights issue so that they would have a clean transition to their new publisher. Dynamite's done great with it, and it's, it's a fantastic show. It's a great comic. Derek and Garth did an amazing job on that, and I wish Wildstorm could have kept publishing it. Yeah, a lot of stories. Wow. And then at what point did you get involved with Vertigo? So Vertigo, let's see. How did I get involved with Vertigo? So I think they were transitioning that. Shelley Bond uh, was the editor who took over the the editorial reins. And then I basically took over the operational end of Vertigo stuff for a few years. So we had, uh, I was traveling to New York quite a bit. I worked with Shelley and Will and Mark Doyle and the crew there. And then when we moved the, the company out, that became business unit that reported up into me right. at the time. And, you know, so at, at Wildstorm too, the other thing I should mention is that we were basically DC skunk works team. We were able to do all these great projects for DC that the main group of folks in New York might not have had the bandwidth or the expertise to do. So we, we ended up doing a lot of the work to launch the digital initiative when DC was finally ready to go digital. And then we were kind of plotting along with that experimenting with different formats and different release cadences and windows. And then it was decided that we were going to go same day digital with the new 52. So when, when the new 52 launched at DC, we went all in and said, and you'll be able to get it digitally the same day. Up until then, there was maybe like a week or a month, or you know, there's some lag time between what was available in print and digital. And it was like, no one's really interested because why should I wait a month to get something digitally that I can get on the stands? So the decision was made with New 52, clean break. If it's going to be out on the stands, it's going to be out on your pad or your phone or your laptop. Yeah, I remember seeing the trailers in movie theaters for the New 52 and explaining that. I was like, what? This is crazy. I, I want to yeah. ask just, um, this is a question we ask everybody. You know, you brought him up several times and he's had many different endeavors, but in your dealings with the big cheese, as they called him at Wizard, we always ask, Garib Seamus, cool or fool? <laughs> he was always cool with me. You know, I certainly lost touch with the guy uh, over the years. I think he wasn't he getting involved with some wrestling thing or oh, he did like MMA, that? yeah, yeah, so he MMA, MMA league. He was starting while he was still publishing Wizard, yeah, that was a, right. a point of contention with the staff. Yeah. Well, and he would have it at the show because I so I did go to a couple Wizard LA shows because I remember. He had some sort of a fighting ring on the floor, right? And then they would have panels, but not in panel rooms. They were panel stages. Am I remembering this right? Yeah, no, you're, you're right. <laughs> okay. yeah, no, like he, was, he was trying to promote his MMA league. And that was, um, you know, he's like, I got a convention. I got a place where people are going to be at. Yeah, that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. No, and then, and then I think a couple years later, wasn't he, wasn't he involved with getting a lot of movie people, like the movie stars, to appear at his shows? For yeah, signatures? So he had his own kind of convention circuit when he was, you know, aside, you know, outside of Wizard World and all that. He was doing his own, yeah, convention organization of all the celebrities. And then he's a fine artist, uh, you yeah. know, now as well. He does a lot of that. But just in, in getting into all of that, how would you describe ultimately looking back now? the legacy of Wizard Magazine, its impact on the industry, you know, for good or for bad. I don't know if I have a strong perspective on that, but it definitely seems to me that Wizard personifies the 90s era of comics. Whatever MTV was with video, you know, they don't they don't have music videos on MTV anymore. But at in the day, MTV 
was you know the place for music videos and, and music news right i think wizard is the equivalent and really personifies comics in the 90s that's what i would say absolutely so obviously armored is at the top of my mind yeah <laughs> but can you tell uh listeners what clover press is all about and uh what other projects you're uh, currently publishing these days? Well, I mean, Clover Press, we're an eclectic publisher out of San Diego. It was founded by Ted Adams and Robbie Robbins, who are, were also two of the co-founders of IDW back in the day. And uh, those cats built that company up to be certainly top five, and sometimes top four sometime. I don't know if they ever got to top three, but certainly top five of the comic book publishers. And they sold their company and uh, left it in 2019 and started Clover Press. And that was essentially just to you know publish an eclectic variety of books that they wanted to publish, like books that they liked. I remember I was at DC when when uh, Ted reached out to let me know that he was doing that, which was pretty cool. He was, he was actually contacting me for a, a rights issue for a, a book that uh, DC had that he was looking to uh, transfer over. So I helped him with that. And when I left DC, I sent my resume around, sent it to Ted. Ted knows everybody, right? So, so it's like, hey, Ted, if you hear anything, uh, let me know. And he called me. He goes, it's so funny that you sent me this because we were just talking about you. We, we thought you know, you might be a good addition to, to come over to Clover. And it's like, oh, okay, like, what would you want me to do? And he said, well, I'm, I'm looking to kind of be semi-retired. So you know, would you be interested in, in coming on as the publisher? It's like, that sounds interesting. So I drove down there and I met with the guys. And we essentially talked about the philosophy of what we do at, at Clover and what they wanted to do. And they like a whole range of things, but you know, they like a lot of horror stuff. They like nicer books. Uh, people call them coffee table books, right? Not necessarily always on your coffee table, but really nice high-end hardcover books, which I absolutely love. I wanted to do more at DC and we did a lot at DC from the absolutes, to the deluxes, plus you know, special editions, the omnibuses. I love art books and I don't think there are enough art books out there. So one of the things that I, I, brought up in our very first meeting was, oh, I see you've got this this one art book from Tim Truman, but you know, I, I would love to do a whole bunch of artists and and look at the retrospectives of their of their art careers. And they, they were like, this is awesome. We would love to do that. So it was a it was, you know, good personality mix, good match for the team. And so I I joined up and I uh, have been working towards that over the last couple of years. Still a passion is to break new talent and find new IP. So, you know, Michael certainly uh, lands in that category. Uh, it's a wonderful book, appeals to a multitude of demographics, uh, has a lot of potential. We have a, a line of books called The Marvel Art Of that we rolled out this year, launching them first on Kickstarter and then uh, putting them out in comic shops and bookstores. But it's exactly what we set out to do, which is basically taking a look at the career of certain artists, in this case, the work that they do at Marvel. And who, who, do you, who have you done so far? So we've done uh, David Mack and Alex Malev and David Nakayama. We've got some amazing people lined up. Can't announce them yet because part of the announcement is to to kick things off, but we'll definitely let you know. And some of them uh, absolutely have been in Wizard Magazine. So I'll kindly request that you interview them. That'd be awesome, yeah. Because <laughs> it's an amazing lineup. Uh, they're just there, and there there just aren't enough weeks in a year to put out the the books that that I want to put out. Right now, you know, again, we're a very eclectic publisher. We've got this fantastic book on Kickstarter. It's, it's Bella Lugosi, The Man Behind the Cape. Not a graphic novel, not even the comic space. It's it's a pictorial biography of Bella Lugosi, basically exploring his entire life and career. Obviously, well known for playing Dracula, but there's so much more about this guy. This is a 700-page biography, including photos of artifacts that have never before been seen. They're from the Lugosi family archives, and they've literally been in the castle for decades. And, and we've got scans and fantastic photos of these things. Uh, but it covers everything from his, his birth to his death, four days of interviews with Ed Wood, wow. uh, talking about the relationship, setting the record straight. Obviously, the Ed Wood movie was a dramatization of their relationship. Fantastic movie, but they got a lot of things wrong. 
So this kind of sets the record straight on those issues. You know, Lugosi was very, very involved with the Screen Actors Guild. His situation with Universal became the foundation for the laws that are in place now for the way people can exploit the likenesses of talent, of, of celebrities, protects their estate and their subsequent descendants, which I think is fantastic. It's, it's a great read. Robert Kramer, a family friend of the Lugosi's for years. And then Lynn Lugosi sparks the granddaughter of uh, Bella has basically opened up the archives for this book. It's it's wow. something really special. I never would have been able to publish this at DC, nor should it be done at DC. So something that I really enjoy at Clover is that we can take a look at these projects and, and really kind of bring them in if we have a passion for them. So that, that's something I certainly have a passion for. We're importing some books from Japan, really fantastic art books. Uh, we've got a, a book called The Mask of Hylia, which is uh, steeped in Philippine mythology, which is important to me. Uh, I learned a lot about my own culture. My mom would, would tell me some of these stories growing up, but it's, it's fascinating to read them now. Folks also don't understand how important the Philippine artistic community is to American comics. Oh, yeah. Uh, so many, so many artists r really were the foundation of, uh, of, of certainly DC and Marvel's line, but uh, obviously other comics as well. It's a thriving culture in the Philippines. And so I think it's important that we, we kind of shine a light on that and bring that as much as we can to the States. Yeah, and Hank, where can people find out about the latest projects online and, and get involved in the Kickstarters and all of that? Where can they find what you guys are releasing? Sure. So, I mean, the best thing, if you're going to support a Kickstarter, is go to Kickstarter. And if you just put in Clover Press, it'll bring up all our projects there. You can also go to uh, cloverpress.us, which is our, our shop and our website. So we will run our news articles and obviously have the books that we have available direct to consumer there on the website, but our books are also available in comic shops and on, and on Amazon. Everywhere fine books are sold. Awesome. Well, Hank, this has been so much fun talking to you. I did want to ask one little bonus question as we close out. You mentioned working with Pat McCallum at DC. Obviously, we <sighs> lost him recently, and that was real tragic. And he was a huge, I mean, he was Wizard Magazine. He was the attitude. He was, you know, everything that, you know, wasn't the business side. He was the creative side, the excitement. So, uh, do you have any specific Pat memories, you know, whether it was in the 90s or whether it was at DC, like, did you have very much interaction with him? I had a ton of interaction with Pat. And, you know, he, he would frequently stop in to my office for a sanity check because it was an it was an insane time when Pat was there, not because Pat was there. Um, <laughs> Although he did some insane things, but insane in the in the fun morale boosting way, not yeah. the insane "Are you crazy? We can't do that" kind of way. So he would come in, and we we have a lot of chats there. He was a big guy, but one of the kindest, gentlest folk you'll ever meet and interact with. I don't know if he did this when he was at Wizard, but uh, he had a tradition at at DC every Thursday, and I don't know why it was Thursday. He would bring in donuts, and he would bring in donuts for for the entire staff, which meant he would bring in like. 200 donuts <laughs> and uh and he just put them out on thursday mornings never asked to be paid for it never tried to get the company to pay for it, never asked for donations he was that was his thing and that just kind of spoke to his generosity he just thought that that was you know by thursday everyone's starting to drag and a donut picks everybody up and so interesting you know when pat was in the office on a thursday because there would be this huge rush to the to the different <laughs> pantries on each floor to get the donuts. And then I also remember going off to lunch and you were in the parking lot. I it was going to my car and he was acting uh, very suspicious in the parking lot. I just, you know, kind of eyeballed him and he's like, don't mind me. I'm not the droid you're looking for. And <laughs> that's not enough for me. So I like walked to see what he was doing. He was feeding a cat and he didn't want anyone to know he was feeding this cat in the parking lot because he was afraid that of course they would try to take the cat and put it in a shelter he wanted he basically developed a pet cat in the dc comics parking lot so, those are the two things that really strike and so i went to go visit some friends at the new dc offices they do a lot of games at dc and uh, they've dedicated the dc game room to pat mccown so there's a nice little plaque with his picture and a write-up of who pat was to dc and it's just it was it's so nice but bittersweet because we've we've lost 
a really really great man so yeah uh thank you so much for sharing those stories that is that is fantastic we did a whole tribute episode to pat and brought out a lot of the wizard guys to share their memories too. oh send me that link i'd love to I'd, yeah you know, i'd love to watch that I'll, I'm, I'll probably start crying but yeah uh, again hank thank you so much for making the time sharing the stories with us mike thank you for setting this up and that does it for this edition of the wizard files thank you so much for checking out this episode big thanks to mike schwartz for setting that up be sure to check out his social media if you want to get the latest on what he is working on in the comic book space with armored that is at the mike schwartz okay you can find him there but of course if you want to find out what he's up to with his comic book collection he's also on instagram at 50 cent comic collector and he's posting stuff daily it looks great it's very fun also want to give another plug if you have hulu he was uh, one of the co-writers of zombie town rl stein's zombie town it's on Hulu. It's a very fun kind of family creature feature. So check that out. Of course, Hank Canals sharing those stories. Gotta love it when a guest is just ready to talk, ready to share. We didn't have to pull too much out of him there. He had the story mapped out in his mind to tell us. So be sure to check out what's going on with Clover Press as well. And like Hank said, sounds like we're going to have some more 90s comic book artists and beyond. People that were involved with Wizard Magazine on some level that are now doing books over at Clover over so look for that in 2024 but look into the future i do want to mention our next edition of the wizard files is the big one this is the episode of the wizard files why we are talking to the big cheese himself garib sheamus that's right we finally have him booked michael and i are talking to him tomorrow as of this recording so very very exciting something to look forward to a little gift that will bring your way in the month of december so stay tuned for that of course if you want to stay tuned to everything that's going on in the world of wizards the podcast guide to comics if you came here the first time just for the interview well go ahead and check out the podcast what do we do well we go in depth on every issue of wizard magazine including the specials occasionally we do a bonus episode about some of the spinoff magazines like toy fair we are going to get into inquest sometime next year and finally check out that world of collectible gaming cards Uh, but also if you check out our mini episodes we get into even more details from the issues sometimes we're doing comic book reviews and other fun stuff that's kind of a grab bag then you could also check out what we're doing on youtube what's going on over there well we have you know our top 10 list that we've been putting together pieces of wizard history mostly focusing on the cover art these days but there's more to come in 2024 some ideas that we've been throwing around some new video series but we also get into our own collections if you want even more content though where do you go patreon.com forward slash wizards comics where for just five bucks a month you're getting a pdf scan of each issue that we're covering you're getting an uncut version of the episode even this interview there's an uncut version of it with extra stories there's more going on there available only to our patrons plus you're getting it up to two weeks early the as soon as we record it we drop it to patreon it's ready to go plus you can also enjoy a bonus podcast that we do called 90 super cinema where we are, are examining and you know revisiting for the most part a bunch of comic book movies from the 90s sometimes they're direct adaptations sometimes they're just in the sphere of comics right uh, but we're also doing a lot of fun things just with our patrons where we get to have individual conversations on a slack channel which is an app where you kind of just have a private chat room we have lots of other content there and perks things to check out i'll let you explore like i said patreon.com forward slash wizards comics and finally if you've just discovered us we are on your favorite podcast apps where you can check out over 240 episodes what are we doing over here it's crazy but you can also go to wizardscomics.com to stream the full archive of episodes there but again thank you for checking out this episode and until next time we're closing the files this has been a presentation of the retro network